Great. Well, here we are again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it gives me great pleasure to present the next presenter to you. It's Mr. Andrew Lovitcher, and he's going to talk to us about finding the fallen. Now, this is a, a, an absolutely wonderful topic to discuss when we're in 2014 and commemorating the 100th year anniversary of the start of World War II, the, World War I, the Great War. Now, Andy Robertshaw is a military historian, author, and broadcaster who has been working on the archaeology of the Western Front for over 20 years. He is, he is the lead historian on the television series Finding the Fallen and the Trench Detectives, and has appeared in uh, Time Team, Who Do You Think You Are, and Find My Past. His approach to family history is based on his extensive knowledge of the primary sources at the National Archive, the Regimental and Corps Museums, and other databases. He regularly helps people with their research and runs the Military Ancestry Roadshow, Mars, in which a team of experts deal with inquiries ranging from Waterloo to the Second World War. So ladies and gentlemen, can I please give a big welcome to Mr. Andy Robertshaw. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, let's get started. Before we go into images, I want to tell a story. Uh, a number of years ago, I heard a Max Miller story. I like Max Miller a lot. Uh, Max Miller said that when he was about 19, he came home and he said to his dad, Dad, I've been walking out with Miss Green. And I want to marry Miss Green. And he said, I'm sorry, son. Uh, when I was your age, before I met your mother, I had a bicycle. I got around a bit. You can't marry Miss Green, she might be your sister. He was disappointed. He went away, came back a month later, and said, I've been walking out with Miss Gray. Really want to marry Miss Gray. And his dad said, Look, I'm sorry, when I was your age, before I met your mum, that I had, had a bike, used to get around a bit, can't marry you, might be your sister. So we left it a while, went home, six weeks later, his dad was out, his mum was in, and he said, Mum, I've come back twice and said, I really want to marry two girls. And he said, before he met you, when he was my age, he had a bike, he got around a bit, and on both occasions he said, could be my sister. You know, I'm worried. He said, don't worry, he's not your dad. <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of gives us a bit of a problem when we think about what we know about why DNA is important. Although I gave that presentation uh, originally when I mentioned this to a society of genealogists, you should have seen their faces, it was worth watching. Anyway, the important thing is that how does this relate to this process? The process of battles and then casualties. Well, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, that we are now in the centenary year of the Great War, and we're all concerned about the missing, the fallen. Um, it didn't used to be a problem. After the Battle of Waterloo, 60,000 dead and wounded, of whom around 20,000 would die, None of them were formally identified. All of them went into mass graves, apart from the officers. And that was always the process. Nobody actually cared. There was no process of identification to worry about. So if anybody in the room now is thinking, we're coming up now to the bicentenary of Waterloo, I wonder what happened to Rifleman Smith and the Rifle Brigade at one who died at Waterloo. Can I find out through the War Graves Commission? Arguably impossible. But what we then get is this. This is what shapes our opinion of the war, the mass graves of the fallen. Now, one of the things to bear in mind here, and it certainly I don't think will come out in the first few months of this centenary year, that actually they represent, if they're British, which they're not actually, 11.8% of those men that are mobilized. In other words, 88% of our soldiers come home and yet most people think it's the majority. 13% of French soldiers die, and for the Germans, it's 16%. Uh, please be a lot more sympathetic to the Serbians, their death rate was 60%. Something we might just consider next time we wonder about Serbian politics. However, we are very fortunate 
insofar as we then got the Imperial War Graves Commission, later the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and they marked and commemorated the fall of the Great War. One of my little uh, bet noirs of battlefield tours at the moment is that we visit the monuments, we visit the cemeteries, we don't actually visit the battlefields. We visit how we remember those. But of course, the reason that you are here now is to ask the question, well, what about that post-Great War identification process? What actually went on? Well, post the Great War, there were systematic searches of the battlefields to try and find the dead. I won't put it up, but I do have examples of what the Imperial War Museum have, which are called grave concentration, so body density maps. And they show, as each area was cleared post-war, as they went across them, using a variety of meal means, largely using long metal pins stuck in the ground, put them in, deep as you can, pull them out, smell them, that's the method. What you then do is you then dig, you also look for discoloration of water on the surface. And what they did is they went across the field and they found an acre, one or two gold bodies, they went, we won't come back here earlier again. They find 500, then that's worth going back to visit once again. This is a dead German, actually in Bonnet-Hamel, photographed by Ernest Brooks in November 1916. This guy actually, just for interest, has not started off there. He's actually been moved with that shovel and he's slid down to be put there to make it more artistic. So don't always believe the photograph. Photographs do lie. But the critical thing about all of this is that what we then get is the fact that we get mass burials. Here, photograph taken during the course of the Great War, a group of Germans, they died in combat. Clearly, you could dig them graves. It's much, much easier to stick them in a trench. Or people talk about the trenches being choked with dead. But one of the things that you then get is that if those guys were lucky, a record was kept of where they died, who they were, and therefore where they were interred, and that may or may not become a cemetery. This is the monument to the missing at Tikbar. 72,000 plus names of the missing. To put that into context, if I was to take out of my back pocket now a coin, flip it five times and get a head every time, that is your percentage chance of being a British soldier who ends up being missing. But of course, after the war, there is an enormous interest in those men whose mortal remains are never recovered. A couple of things to bear in mind about this one. One, bodies that are missing do not mean that you're not recovered. It simply means that you were not identified at the time. And to be absolutely clear about this, I won't talk about other armies, I'll talk about the British Army. At the outbreak of the war, we have a pretty foolproof system of identification. It's an aluminium disc on which is your name, your rank, your number, your religion, sometimes even more information because there are no army numbers for officers. So it'll say adjutant, signals officer, very useful stuff. The problem is that aluminium is a strategic material. Therefore, we do away with it, and we replace it with a disc made of red vulcanized fiber, which according to the mythology, and there is a mythology, neither burns nor rots. Guess what? They do both. It is basically heat-treated cardboard, insulating material, but absolutely no chance of surviving, unless you have absolutely unique conditions it will rot within weeks or months. Critical thing is then, having had the Battle of the Somme, in which so many men been, end up being missing, we had a second one, octagonal, made of green vulcanized fiber. The problem is this, you happen to die on the 1st of July 1916, we probably won't recover your body. What we'll do instead is you'll remain in no man's land, but your mates will go out, and they will find your ID tag, they will cut it off, 
take everything else personal and then mail it back. That's the way it works. The army largely keep the ID tag. Sometimes it's mailed home, even with bloodstain. The fact is then the family can go, oh, Fred's died, here's the ID tag, that's great, he's actually been registered. No, somewhere out in front of our position is a body that will remain on the sun there for probably the next 6 to 12 months before we overrun the area. When we overrun the area, we find the human remains, we we'll leave the activities of rats and other vermin. But what we're then going to consider is we very carefully removed the only means of identification that was on the body, which actually was the ID tag, which is why we had a second ID tag in September 1916. The theory being the red one will therefore remain on the body, we remove then the octagonal one, uh, so other way around. However, this then leads to other problems. The problem being then, of course, is that when we do battlefield clearance, if the tags are so fugitive, which they are, even if the body is left with its tag, it probably will rot away. I have, in 20 years of archaeology, found one British ID tag on a member of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. It survived for one reason only. He'd actually taken it from around his neck and put it in his top pocket and it was sat in the bowl of his spoon. As the spoon corroded, the bacteria that would normally have eaten the tag can't do that. The bad news is the tags are marked by being stamped. When they get wet, all the information is lost as it simply puffs up like a cheese quaver. But there was another problem. And the other big problem is this. People's expectation of what can be achieved. Here we have a pair of British soldiers' lower limbs, snapped off basically mid-shaft, probably by means of a shovel. The rest of the body was excavated when they dug a new trench. This is a burial that's been disturbed. Theoretically, However, when people say to me, oh, how many bodies have your team found? Well, arguably, think about it, although he's got his feet and the shaft snapped off by some means, that guy could have died in the 1960s. He would have been wheelchair bound, doesn't necessarily mean that he died. We have on one occasion found a head and nothing else. I suspect he died on the spot. But you see the problem. If you find a hand or a lower arm, does not mean, even if we go to DNA, that that guy definitely died. One of the reasons why the TV series goes from being called Fighting the Fallen to the Trench Detectives is actually we discovered there was a lot more evidence on the material carried on the human remains than necessarily the body. Also, by the way, at the end of series one, the project for the TV company director and had enough of dead people, as he put it very carefully. Sometimes we're very, very fortunate with this process. This is a German ID tag, made of zinc. Later in the war, they actually be bifurcated. The information is repeated, and there's a series of holes down the middle. The idea of the German army, which is very clever, is that if you die, your mates or the grave registration unit snap the lower half off, the other part, still fastened the cord, is round your neck. It will then survive in the ground, as you will see. This particular tag was recovered from the area of the airport near uh, Albert called Mailes, where they built the uh, European Airbus, by the way. This man was ploughed out of the ground. The farmer, exceptionally, as far as I'm aware, saw what had happened, went back, got a crate, collected all the components up, including the ID tags and also everything else on the body, put it in the crate and handed it to the War Graves Commission, who asked me to find out who he was. We found out who he was and when he died. And this one, in this case, Edward Bergman, died in the fighting in August 1918. Basically, no DNA required. However, what you also get are mass graves like this. 
Now, Edward Bergman was found accidental. Bodies turn up on a regular basis. Ditching, building foundations, pipelines. It happens constantly. Sometimes it is done deliberately. Now, we'll come back to Fromel, which many of you know about already, because that's a deliberate exhumation. Here, this actually is a mass grave from the very beginning of the Great War. One of the young officers that was killed in the French army was a novelist and poet called Alain Fournier. When Alain fell, he was buried by the Germans in a mass grave. Ten years ago, a French team went out, found the location, found all of them, and of the 36 men found, the majority were identified simply by means of their pocket contents. DNA was not required under these circumstances. Why? Because they knew a discrete number of bodies were buried. The Germans had kept very careful records. They were able to find the burial pit, exhume the bodies, and because the Germans had basically been careful or careless, depending on how you look at it, they left a lot of identification on the bodies. The majority were then identified. They also, critically, had a list of human remains against which, or missing people, they could check exactly who they got. Systems then exist to do this wherever possible. But this is a, a random group here of German soldiers found on the Western Front. My involvement in all of this would be, if I was asked to go to site, was to point out that down there we have a German helmet. They don't actually exist in the northern Somme area until really September, October of 1916. So these guys here have been buried after that period. We do similar things with anti-gas equipment. But when people are confronted by this kind of image, they do have some very, very odd ideas. Just give you an idea. I'll show you in a minute a photograph of a man called Alain, uh, a man called Jakob Honnitz. Jakob Honnitz was the first set of human remains I ever worked on. He had been laid by his brother Christian in a shell hole. But that meant he was in a natural sleeping position with his head higher than his body. The problem with that was that the farmer, Monsieur Suman, and his dad, I know who they are, had ploughed his head off. Not literally, it had been ploughed off. A member of the public said, what are you doing, having come to site? This is a site near set, so we are covered some human remains. Could I pay my respects? And we said, yes. She came along, having gathered up, beautifully, poppy petals. What a lovely thing. Yeah? And she came along, and she threw them in the air, and they scattered all over Jacob's remains, which had just been prepared for photography by a group of three archaeologists who take eight hours to do it. She learned some new swear words in Flemish. The critical thing was that having looked at the body, however, she looked at Jacob's remains. We did not, by the way, use her method, and said, well, I suppose you'll use dental records, will you? As the guy didn't have a head, that was an interesting concept. The other thought would be, and I'm sorry to make this kind of quite light, is that even if we did have dental records, what do we do? Go to every dentist archive in Germany in the hope that somehow we're going to find out what his fillings were. Because that's clearly what she thought we were going to do. And I'm afraid to say things like CSI, when you put in a bit of data or press a button and it actually gives you its home address and inside leg measurements, doesn't work in reality. The reality is there's a lot more work to do when you start with this, before we can start using DNA. Now, clearly, isotope analysis will tell you where he grew up, will tell you potentially where he moved from. If you've got no German helmet, which is a bit of a clue that this guy might be German, yeah? Is that it will tell you, is he actually Australian? He might do, but 60% of Australian soldiers were born in Britain or went to Australia. So it doesn't actually work, and that's quite interesting. But it will tell you, for example, is he from Rendsburg? Is he from Hamburg? Is he from Saxony? Which will help narrow things down, and that's using, obviously, isotope analysis. Sometimes the analysis of these burials is um, 
shall I say, suspect. This is a group of the Grimsby Chums, Lincolnshire Regiment, discovered while they were looking, in fact, for a Roman cemetery. Um, in fact, the um, people that found them were really keen, because at one point they came in and went, you're not going to believe it, Alan, because it was Alan was in charge, uh, Alan Jack, we've actually found them. They've got boots on, just like Roman soldiers. That's really good. Followed by the words, guess what? They've got helmets on. And he thought, we've never found a Roman helmet in a cemetery. And then he said, they've also got a rifle. Unlikely to be Romans. They were, in fact, cash from 1917. But the media decided that they'd be linked arms, like some sort of odd dance macabre. In fact, what happened here is they started by filling the grave from the right-hand body here, and each body was then laid, using the space effectively, overlapping his comrade. Their arms aren't linked, they just have to lie over each other. But again, people like to romanticise these things. The reality is not romantic, but what it is is intriguing, is because somebody has gone to support the bother of laying out in a naturalistic way partial casualties with the arm bones and leg bones in the correct place in the grave, even though the rest of the body wasn't recovered, which would be useful. But again, from this, here we've got 27 bodies. If you know a particular unit on a particular day loses 27 casualties, what you can then do is theoretically appeal to the families to come up with the DNA to allow you then to use the samples that were taken. However, forget it. Because when these bodies were recovered, the policy of the War Graves Commission was that no samples could be taken from human remains. Therefore, that was never done. As far as I'm aware, very few positive results came out of this one because of the policy of the War Graves Commission. Why? Because DNA is expensive, was expensive, is getting lesser, and it will raise expectations amongst families that somehow there will be a database. But there is no database. Now, let's go back to that once more. Some of you will be aware that a few years ago there was an enormous fuss about John Kipling, Rudyard Kipling's son. Killed at the Battle of Lewes, the body was identified as actually being a body that was recovered. However, the soldier that was recovered was wearing two pips on his shoulders, a first lieutenant. At the time of his death, John Kipling was a second lieutenant. He did not know that he had been promoted. Therefore, the body was recovered, putatively described as being John Kipling, and is buried with his name on the headstone, which is lovely. However, because of the policy, no sample was kept, and although historians, not me, have then questioned this identification, it is not possible now to go back and exhume the remains because that's not the policy of the War Graves Commission. It is simply not done. However, you will be aware that has now changed. This is the result of the work done at Fromel by Oxford Archaeology. A project started by Glasgow University Archaeological Research Department, which ultimately led to the recovery of Australian human remains and British. We'll come back to that. But just to give you some nuts and bolts, this is where I cut my teeth. This is Admiral Williams's house on the Somme. No human remains, but we learned an awful lot about excavating trenches. From there, we went to work at Serre, and this is the recovery here of one of three sets of human remains discovered in our early archaeology. People that did the work, by the way, Justin um, uh, uh, was one guy, the other guy is Luke Barber, who normally works for Sussex, uh, and also works for Sussex and Kent Police, and then Yannick de Gris, who does the same job, or did do at least until recently, for the Association for World War Archaeology in Belgium. She was the one that was swearing in Flemish, by the way. Um, this is the set of remains as recovered. When they were recovered, and this is now 10 years ago, although we had a very high level of preservation, we were told very, very clearly 
that no samples were to be taken of any sort. Instead, we had to rely on what came with the body. We had the remains here with his boots, we had uniform, we had equipment, we also had here in his small trouser pocket where you'd normally keep a watch, a disc which came from a company called Brudingham Brothers, which actually is in Stuttgart. This soldier is a Wurzenberger, so all of the evidence for him was non-DNA. Why? Because we were denied the chance. But bear in mind, if you're going to contemplate finding a body by pure chance on the battlefield, and then say, we now need to take DNA from somebody, there has to be a process before you actually get to the point of getting the DNA sample. We also found this guy, the next day, an unknown no member of the King's Lancaster Regiment. He was one of 110 men missing from that unit that day. He was very, very difficult to work on. And in fact, we had absolutely no success. But when he was buried, come to that in a minute, we actually then had two families turn up and say, we think it's our grandfather and or great uncle. Was there a sample kept? kept because we're happy to provide one to test against. Answer was, no sample taken, tough luck, you will have to come along. So we've now got a situation where at Sayre Cemetery number two, two competing families turn up to leave little offerings, believing it still could be their relative, but they will never know because that chance has been denied. This, by the way, here is a man called um, Albert Tielica, uh, a German officer, the first two, the first guy and the third guy were both Germans. British guy was removed in ultimately a small mini coffin, two Germans went in cardboard boxes, and then we have the great advantage of a conservation laboratory. I have to tell you, a number of years ago, there was a television program made called Battlefield Scavengers about the work of the diggers, in uh, EPA, and in that program, an ID tag came up, it was a metal one, the question was asked by the guy behind the camera, you know the way it is, camera on you, look at the man next to the camera, don't look at the camera, he asked the question, well, whoever the guy was, can you tell me, is there anything on that ID tag? The guy literally went, no, nothing on it. What a remarkable occurrence. Basically, if you're going to do this, you need the backup of scientists and you need the backup of a conservation laboratory, in this case UCL, where I'm a visiting lecturer. For us, we had to then simply go visit the monument to the missing, the one I described in Tifa, and say, having read the names out, all the members of the King's Lancaster Regiment, our British soldier, he's in there somewhere, let's hope we're lucky. We weren't. Because we had no DNA, he was buried as an unknown soldier of the regiment. And he now lies in the grave about 50 metres from where we found him. The Germans were more lucky. What? Answer. The VDK, the German War Graves Commission, has no state funding. So when we said to them, can we please take away items from the sets of human remains and analyze them, answer was, do what you like, give them back when you finish. When we said, can we use isotope analysis, can we use DNA, they went, have you got the money for it? Yes, crack on with it. Yeah? And this is the ID tag found on headless corpse number one. All we've got on it is reserve number, some are missing, seven company, number two, the other digits are missing. If anybody is interested, one of the really odd, ironic things about the Great War is one man, Fritz Haber. Fritz Haber is the man that develops German gas, first used in the spring of 1915. He went home, hadn't done the gas attack, told his wife what he'd done. She was also a scientist and went to a reception at Potsdam. When, she, when he got back from the reception, literally, in the library, with service revolver, his wife had committed suicide. 
However, as a boon to all mankind, Fitz Harbour also synthesised nitrate fertiliser. What a great thing. Unfortunately, nitrate fertiliser leaches out of the soil, destroys bodies, including DNA, and that's what's caused the corrosion on this ID tag. Interesting, isn't it? Important thing is, my German had written his name on the back in a way that he shouldn't have. And one of the things that you have to be aware of is metal is incredibly useful. It is reasonably resilient. And he written his name, Jakob Honest, his home, and we were able to identify him. And ultimately, that here, that man there, that's Jakob Honest, the headless body that we found. Now, I have to say, that was done without DNA. What was curious is when we found his set of human remains, 36-year-old day labourer, conscripted into the German army, or called up, he had a manicure set in his pocket. When I met Walter Rapp, his grandson, he was the same height as his granddad, and incredibly well-groomed. I never discussed it with him, but it was really curious to realise, guess what? Apart from the fact that I'm not a headless corpse, you're a lot like your granddad, aren't you? The critical thing is then, we've then got this. Because this is the other German body. We've got a watch, which is stopped at about ten past six. We don't know whether that was morning or evening. We've then got a Neolithic hand axe, which he picked up and was in his bread bag, along with that thing, which we thought was a photograph album. It wasn't. Now, very recently, they buried some casualties that were recovered on the western front, members of the Honorable Artillery Company. In both cases, it was the metal items that identified them. An ID tag, personal one, and a finger ring with a man's initials on it. Great. Forget metal. Metal's nice, but it's not always what we use. If you've got a system in place, go for the contents of his pockets. Because that's what identified it. That is a bank book. No, there was no money. We checked. The critical thing was it came from a place called Halberstadt, which is North Germany. This soldier was in the uniform of a Württemberg regiment. Württemberg is southern Germany. When you're called up in the German army, you're called up from your local area. There is no reason why somebody with a Halberstadt bank book would be serving in a Württemberg regiment. Except... If you're a patron decorator that relocates in 1912 to Stuttgart to open your painting and decorating business and then get called up locally. We got him without means of DNA simply because we were able to do it by means of conservation laboratory. That led to an advert which was placed by Walter Rapp to say we're looking for the family and we found Walter, by the way, because the family records, so the record centre in the village of Munchingham, knew who he was. Our other man, Albert Tilica, as we discovered, had no family, so he simply put an advert in the Süddeutsche Zeitung, and we simply were able to then contact the members of the family. And this is a photograph, sadly, not of Jacob, but of his brother but exactly the right period, the right uniform. And that was done really for the benefit of Carl Tielecker and his wife, Alison. Uh, by the way, a curious link here, by the way, is that Carl is German, Tielecker. Alison is from Britain. They met at Reading University where they were studying the poetry of Wilfred Owen and the art project we were engaged in was actually looking for the dugout about which Wilfred Owen wrote the poem Blinded of the Century. It gets weird, doesn't it? Anyway, the critical thing is, they were then buried at La Brie, which is a cemetery on the German-French border. Why is that? Because the Germans can tend graves more easily the closer to Germany that they are. Remember that there is no state funding. Ultimately, Walter on the ramp, people involved in the programme, including uh, uh, Volker and myself, we actually unveil this monument, which is the only monument on the Somme to both British, guy in the middle, and the two Germans, Jakob and obviously Albert 
see that. Um, ultimately, this rather odd thing turned up, and this turned out to be a commemorative postcard for the 40 fallen comrades of number 7 company of Reserve Regiment 121. Both Jakob and Albert Tilica were in number 7 company and they were buried when we discovered them on the back of a trench. This was clearly sent home because they were missing. But they were, at least when this was made, this trench commemorates where they were buried. The Germans intended to go back and recover them and bury them in the fullness of time. We arguably missed the other 38. It is likely that they were recovered post-war in the process I described. The critical thing is, we then went on to do more projects. Here, ahead of illegal dumping and moving of topsoil. We were able to, in fact, discover a set of human remains. I found this particular guy by the simple experience of breaking his jaw. The hole in his skull is caused by a shell fragment. We had no idea who they were to start with. It was a process of working, in this case, working in shifts overnight because we'd been raided by people with metal detectors and torches the previous night. So we worked in eight hour shift for the next 36 hours, recovering what proved to be the remains of in fact one, two, three, four, five individuals. Here, we could use DNA if we wished. We took samples, the problem was, or opportunity, it really wasn't necessary, because the guys were wearing their uniforms, which had survived almost complete the ones in the middle. They proved to, in fact, to be Bavarians from the buttons, to be infantrymen, and in this case, one of them had the ribbon of the Iron Cross still pinned to his uniform. We already knew that actually he was a corporal because of his insignia on his shoulder, and once again, back to pocket contents, we have this, because this was inside his paper, and this conserved is a postcard to Gefeiter Corporal Leopold Rothermel from Munich on the 25th of September 1915. Looking at the records, he was killed on the 3rd of October 1915. This presumably was one of the last things that he ever received. But what we also were able to discover is that Leopold Rothermel was in fact a concert violinist who had volunteered after his brother Otto had been killed. And what's really interesting is I could now do an Elvis Presley lick because this songbook in his pocket has the words to a song, Wooden Heart, which Elvis Presley made famous having returned back from Germany in after his military service. Don't often get this. Again, no use of DNA. However, had we found the family, we could certainly have tested. We didn't need to, we felt, because when we went to the Munich Record Center, and anybody here who whinges about the way that the Germans bombed our records in the Second World War, meaning there were no First World records, or 40% are left, don't worry. If you're Prussian, we got a lot in 1945. You need to be either Bavarian or Württemberger who kept their records. If you do that, they're absolutely complete. However, we continue to work. And one of the other things that we then did is we went back to a site that we'd worked on before and we discovered a very unusual thing. This is a grave cut for a soldier. Very unusual. Most of the guys that we found come from shell holes or trenches. And we know that this particular soldier, tall man, my height, was buried at night. Come on, how do we know he's buried at night? Answer, when you dig a grave slot, you dig it wider for the shoulders than the feet. If you bury him in the dark, you get him the wrong way around. And that's what we've got. So what we then had was then back to metal. This time, three rings. One, basically trench art, flounder and flounders, and then two rings, one marked Martin, one marked Becker, and the year 1883. 
Now we already knew that he was around mid-30s, so it wasn't his wedding rings. We assumed he was there for an orphan and began work on that. In fact, what we discovered was more interesting, that here he is, Alfred Marty, his mother is actually Maria Becker. This is a soldier that was killed in mid-October 1915 during the fighting at Looms at Loss. Now, we were able to find the family. We were able to find in the church an account of him with a photograph. And there he is. He's got ears like mine as well as big my eyes. And we were able to meet the family. And in terms of the, the great joy of this is that we could have checked against the DNA, but the wedding ring story could be checked against the family. We said we found both wedding rings. They went, yeah, you would have done. So was that because his parents died? Oh no. What happened? Maria ran away with a teacher before the First World War. Being a teacher, I think that's a really good choice. Alfred remarried. And actually, my apologies, his father, Julius, remarried somebody called Juliana, which would make great fun with Christmas cards. Then daughter was born five months later. Another miracle. But this young man, by that stage, was no longer in the family home because when Julius was ill, he managed to bankrupt the family by leaving all the grapes on the vines. They were hit by frost. I think that his dad said, your mum was a bad lot, you're a bad lot, have these and bugger off. So one of the things is here, when we look at these guys, aren't they all past the saints? This guy's a real person. Warts and all. And the big ears. But then let's come back to this. Because this is a photograph taken by the Germans at Frommel. It shows the casualties from the disastrous attack of mid-July 1916. Which was meant to pull German forces away from the Somme. It did not work. Combination of Australian and British soldiers went into the attack, and at the end of it, we've got scenes like this. Now, the bodies here are stacked up like cordwood. Why? Because the Germans decided there were so many, they would be a hazard to sanitation, and to recover them, and to move them to pits, where they could be dealt with separately. So what we've then got are these photographs showing that process, and the Germans document all of it. They end up with four pits near Frommel, identified both on the ground and by aerial photographs, containing, in theory, around 500 bodies. Guard did their preliminary study, said yes, some of the grave slots are full. It was then put to contract, Oxford Archaeology got the job, and they then began work. It was done as a crime scene, and there was an enormous amount of fuss. But very importantly, the War Graves Commission from day one said, take the samples. No human remains will be photographed or shown, but the process will lead to identification. Amazingly, they were able to then use the DNA, which had been gathered largely from Australian donors, to identify over a hundred bodies. The last of those identifications will be achieved by the 19th of July this year. They're then going to stop. No, I don't know why either, but that's what they're going to do. The critical thing is that the bodies will then move to a new cemetery. However, critical things about it. One, it seems to have changed the War Graves Commission's attitudes towards taking DNA. Next thing, these bodies are taken from a particular site on a particular day and put in graves where they know where they are. There's a problem. Within a month of the conclusion of this archaeology, I got emails from Australia that said, we haven't been lucky. We provided DNA, but they haven't found great uncle Alfred or Albert. Andy, what are you going to do about it? Well, if you give me another two or five million, I'll have a crack at it. But the fact is they found 250 bodies out of 500. That meant half are missing. Of those, the remaining half of those have 
are the only ones who identify. It means that three quarters of people who anticipated 100% results or hype have been disappointed. Now, this is not to say they should not have done it. It merely indicates to you that if we go to the Western Front and remains are recovered and they are brought back and are then worked on by forensic anthropologists, people like myself help to date the evidence, we may stand up with this situation because however good the DNA is, the metal items of the body are the bits that will tell you his regiments. They will tell you when he died because of his gas mask or helmet or the nature of the rifle or the grenades in his pockets. As to whether you can then possibly identify him further requires having a pool of DNA. However, it does not exist. If it did, every single person that was recovered could be tested against the database and then we'd be able to possibly have a higher percentage of finding them. However, that's not policy. It's an incredibly difficult job to achieve. However, there are still people out there that anticipate that their relative will be found unidentified. When Jakob Hannes was identified, his son, born unbelievably on Christmas Eve 1914, was actually in a home. He was in a hospice and he was dying. Walter went to him and said, Dad, they found your father on the Western Front. And he said, how about this for enigmatic? I always knew they would. I always knew they would. Many of you will have expectations of what will happen. I will tell you now, recovery can be done by means of a careful farmer. It can be done by a group working for television with tainted TV money looking for bodies. It can be found by people ahead of developments putting in a pipeline as happened at the scene. It can be done by people trying to recover shoulder titles to sell them on eBay who don't care about the set of human remains. Or it could be discovered, as has happened recently, by people widening the road, digging along the front of a cemetery on the sod, and leaving exposed human remains to be found by my, one of my volunteers who said, I think that's a set of human remains. And they went up to you, mate. He phoned the police, phoned the War Graves Commission, and then luckily, luckily, it's only luck, Peter Barton and his team were working at the glory hole at La Boiselle. They had a small team who could come up in two cars and achieve a recovery, wait for it, and without DNA, an identification. DNA is an incredibly useful tool when we're used in conjunction with other methods of getting to that point. Without it, we would have enormous problems. However, we have a limited database, we have limited opportunities. The question will be, what happens next? We're now in the centenary year. I would argue that a soldier recovered in 1917 should have the same opportunity as being identified and buried with his mates, correctly marked by regiment as men, even if he's found tomorrow. I really do not think that's the case. I think to some extent we've lost our way and actually we're missing the opportunity, not least there, we are so much further down the road of having scientific techniques to lead to a positive identification and that chance to phone someone up and say, we found your great uncle, we found your grandfather. Well, still, they found your dad. And imagine what that would still mean today. Somebody once described death in war as being equivalent to throwing a stone into a pond. Ripples go out and they come back but they don't stop. And it matters, if not as much, but it matters greatly to the family. Whether they're French or Belgian 
or American or Australian or Canadian or German, it doesn't matter. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't care who we identify as long as I've got occasionally the chance to see somebody buried. And to see in one of those memorial books his place of burial is not known. And then to be able to say to myself, yes it is, because I was there when we buried him. And even if we don't know where the family is now, in a few years' time, someone might pop up and go, I'm Leopold Rothamel's great nephew, and we understand that we found him, where is he buried? That matters a great deal. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Who would like to ask Andy some questions? Right. We have a question here. Andy, you get you gave that obviously a very clear enunciation of, of you say the perceptions of the people yes. that have and do not in recovering, you know, DNA from these people. Yeah. I presume on the few occasions where you can use DNA to do it, you're looking at mitochondrial DNA yes. to do this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it is a mitochondrial DNA. It's not my department. No. I have to confess, I'm not even an archaeologist. I'm a historian no. that hangs out about with archaeologists. That's right. okay? it, it's the Richard III phenomenon. In the language, yes. the people that's here, yeah, it's that's doing it. that same sort of reconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Any other questions? I have a question over here. You talked about knowing where people were buried before you start looking. Yeah. My experience has been the Canadian records of where people were originally buried seems to be better than the British yeah. Is that actually true? Yes, I, I, I think certain armies are much better at recording where people are buried. Um, sometimes we're very fortunate. For example, I'm working at the moment with the Leinsters. Um, they have a number of bodies, number of men missing from October 1914. The reason we know where they are is that after the war, the, a German officer who had helped to a unit to bury British dead, Irish dead, wrote to the officer's parents and said, my men buried your son in 1914. They died gallantly, and this is the map reference to where they are. Sometimes the records are absolutely abysmal. And sometimes, and I have to say, if there's a book called um, uh, No Labour, No Battle, about the work of the Labour Corps in the First World War, there's an account in there of an Australian officer working at Hugh Crater being reprimanded for doubling his body counts of burials by getting his men to chop British soldiers in two to bury them as two different bodies. So next time you've got a huge crater, you look at that cemetery and you think, there's X number of bodies in here. Guess what? There isn't. So there's some very, very dodgy things went on after the war. And of course, and this gets really, really scary, do not contemplate offering a bounty for body recover, recovery. We did that after the war. And what will happen then is that if you're French, or British, or Belgian, or American, there's money. If you're German, there's no money. The Belgian farmer who's hard up in 1919 finds a German soldier, yeah, called Fritz, all he does is he finds out his bar, a pair of British Army boots and a helmet, puts it in the box, hands it over to the War Graves Commission, takes his bounty, and Fritz is buried as Frank, an unknown British soldier. That happened repeatedly. So again, next time you look at a British cemetery, go look at the unknown Brit. He may well not be. So you've got to bear that in mind. So the only offering money is a very, very dangerous problem. It really is. I was called not long ago to take a set of human remains that had been dug out of Tinval Wood. They were simply in a black bin bag, which is rather better than how they were found, because they were found scattered around a crater as if terriers had been digging. Someone had been in the wood and exhumed it, and because everything had gone, we don't even know whether it was British or French or whatever. It's simply a mass of bones. And he was buried as an unknown of the Great War. Another question? I've cheered them up now. Well, uh, oh, there's one over here. In 
it's just really quick when you said that there was a German version of the War Greaves yes. Commission, VBK, is that right? VDK, yeah. VDK. Uh, Volkswagen Kreisfahrt. It's, it's, it's the German War Greaves Commission. So they obviously have lists of names and who they're buried as well. Yeah, um, the, their problem is twofold. One, they've got no state funding. The other problem is they've got a million missing on the Eastern Front. And recently, dry summers, huh, have meant that areas that were inaccessible have now opened up. And I was asked to go do some work recently um, with a, an archaeological team put together by a TV company in Russia. I refused because the business of recovery, German remains in particular, ignore the Russians, that's done by volunteers. The German remains that are being recovered, the stuff that comes off them is very high value. We're talking iron crosses, German stuff, Lugers, that kind of stuff. That whole business is controlled by the Russian Mafia. If you get in their way, you might well join them. So I simply declined to be involved. And if you think that's overstating it, not long ago, a set of bodies of Republicans recovered from near Barcelona. During the process, a live bullet was taped to the windscreen of the crew bus with the words, you're next, on it by somebody who was definitely a nationalist supporter. Some of this stuff is a really hot topic. Any other questions? One question here. If you have a missing relative, and um, lowered our expectations, yeah, sorry. Um, how, how, um, how would you, or who should you register with so that there is DNA to match if it's suspected that an ancestor is? Well, I, I think it's worth talking to, well, I mean, what do you think? What, I pass it over to you, I don't know, because right? I, I have no solution to that. I have done a DNA test yes. with um, Family Tree DNA, yeah. and I've also registered with the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and have I done the right thing? Yes, you definitely have. I mean, the more people that do it, the more pressure there is on them to say, we've got this grand database, and apart from storing the information, it's not costing us anything. Actually, you know, if you if you knew that your relative is missing in Tikval Wood rather than the Western Front, or you know that he died in a particular day in a particular location, it means that if someone comes up with a set of remains in Marmets or Ser or whatever, actually they might they might just go, Well, guess what? We, we, we've got eight or nine from this location. Oh look and it happens to be border regiment, well it's worth a go, isn't it? Yeah? I think you know, we can kind of not be subversive, just help them along because they don't see it as their responsibility. I've been told twice now the work of the war resolution begins at the cemetery gates. Didn't used to, it does now. So there isn't any way that the, the War Graves Commission currently is looking for DNA or they're not. They're not at no. all. No, they'll take it, they'll take samples if if, if the someone pays for it, mm -hmm. in this case the, the money from the Australian government. I suspect if, if there was an archaeological project that was funded with the same deal, they would then store that data, um, but it's not done as a matter of course. Now, I saw recently in the newspaper that, I think it was the War Graves Commission, were looking for the family of an Irish soldier. Yes. What was the story there, and is there any DNA involved? I don't know if there is. I think they probably would use that as the acid test, having established a, a family link. So yes, I think it's kind of because they've done from L, which we know about. It's changed their, their 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 view of the value of DNA and what it can actually mean, and also the fact that it brings you know, closure to the families because it definitely does. Well, coming back to this latest question, I think what we in the genetic genealogy community can do today is actually start a project with Family Tree DNA so that anybody who has had their DNA tested can join relatives of World War I victims. And that way, there will be a project where DNA can be stored and kept. Okay. That's something we can do today, so I'll organize that. Lovely. Thank you. <coughs> if you've already had your DNA taken, um, but it wasn't through ancestry. Can you still use that? If you have had your DNA test from Family Tree DNA, then certainly you can go into the Family Tree DNA project. If you've had it taken with ancestry DNA, 
or with 23andMe, you can upload your DNA to Family Tree DNA and join the project that way. Good. There's also another uh, free website called GetMatch, where you can upload your uh, DNA from Ancestry DNA and Family and 23andMe to GetMatch, and then compare it with anybody else in the database who's actually uploaded their DNA there. <laughs> the only caution I would ask would add to that is, is, is the question that I asked was, 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 was what was tested and the answer that seemed to be mitochondrial DNA you know from there the thing that we're talking about there is autosomal DNA and, that, and that's different yeah. so the mitochondrial DNA really as far as I know is done by 23andMe and not by the other companies that we're testing it out I think yeah Okay. Any other questions? One over here. It's, it's the picture of Waterloo at the beginning that made me think. Uh, archaeologists have done Romans buried and, yep. and come up with where they came from. Um, presumably we know where the mass graves were in the historic, are in the historic battle. Uh, I know they go through the stage roughly where they are at Rook's Drift. Yeah. Is there any possibility that we're going to be able to... It's not the policy to exhume uh, remains, although th there is a discussion about doing some work ahead of the bicentenary of Waterloo to see whether there are mass graves. Um, I know where one is. It's under a concrete pad um, outside the front of Hougamont. Again, there's a whole question of ethics about digging them up and what you're trying to achieve. That said, not long ago, a set of human remains were recovered. Sadly, the DNA was degraded. Um, one found in the dunes as well of a soldier from the Valdshorn expedition. Um, there was still the possibility of identifying these guys, and the family obviously would still be very pleased. Um, but actually, once they're in a war grave, that's it. Can't touch them. Okay. Great. Any further questions? Fine. Well, uh, uh, Andy, you really have capture their imagination and it's an absolutely fantastic presentation that you've given us uh, how apt it is that we're here and celebrating well commemorating the 100 year anniversary of the start of world war one and there still is so much work to be done in trying to identify our ancestors and relatives who passed away on the battlefields of world war one and this i think the conversation we've had today is the start of a new and exciting adventure in trying to find and connect with these ancestors. So, Andy Robertshaw, thank you very much.
Thank <laughs> you. 